Hey friends, in this video we're going to look at some super basic VEX, specifically the I2A function, which is the VEX equivalent of the backtick, which I spoke about in part two of this series. So feel free to go check that out if you don't know how to use backticks and channel expressions. I wanted to cover just a tiny little bit of VEX in this fundamental series for a couple reasons. First, just to simply highlight the difference between Houdini channel expressions and full-on VEX scripting. Second, I want to hammer home this concept of attributes, especially common attributes, and hopefully demystify them a bit for you, and see how you can just do things manually rather than having to rely solely on the dedicated nodes. Sometimes it's just quicker and more flexible way to work. So let's get to it. So we're going to use the same setup here as in the backticks video, and if you haven't watched that, I'll just put a link to the project file below. So let's assign a random material to each variation, just like we did in the backticks video. Except this time, instead of doing it with channel expressions in the material node, we're just going to use vex to generate the random value and assign the material all in one fell swoop. Okay, so a wrangle will run over every point in your geometry or every primitive. We are using packed geometry here, which exists in Houdini as a point and a primitive simultaneously. Yes, it's weird, and I may do a video about them later on, but for now, let's just go with it. So let's drop down a primitive wrangle, or any wrangle, as long as it's set to primitive here. Now let's get a random number for each object, and we'll use the current primitive number as the seed. So here we are declaring an integer variable with the int to hold our random number. Then we call the rand function, and as a seed we just use this handy built-in attribute called at prim num which is a nice feature in VEX, and it'll just grab the current prim that's being operated on or looped over. And then we're multiplying that by the number of materials just like last time. Also just like last time, we need to wrap this into an int function so we can get an int value and not a float. Remember the rand function will give you a float value, and we already told Houdini to look for an int value when we declared this attribute variable. Okay, so let's check the attribute spreadsheet. And yep, we have a random number on each primitive slash point slash object now. So now we have our random number and we can assign our material directly in the wrangle as well using the shop material path attribute. Now if you don't know, all the material node actually does is assign this attribute to the primitives of your geometry. Well technically it does some other stuff too, but don't worry about that right now. If you assign this manually in a wrangle, it's going to have the exact same effect. Let's try it out. Voila, we have randomness, we have proceduralism, we win forever. You can see here that the I2A function is doing the same thing as the backticks would, taking a numerical calculation and converting it into a handy string that we can use anywhere we want. This is a simple but important lesson about attributes because you can see here that we're not beholden to the material sop to assign a material, which is really powerful because now you have complete control. All you have to do is put a little string together and you're good to go. This same principle applies all over Houdini too. Like in a pop sim where you can create your own velocity or V attribute, Houdini knows to look for an attribute called V, so it will just work right out of the box. And yeah, sure, there are a bunch of nodes that can help out, but ultimately if you want to just completely create this yourself, you have that power. You can do really creative stuff too, like if you have a CD attribute, well, guess what? That's a vector, just like V, so why not have your color control the velocity? This is what makes Houdini so damn cool and so damn fun, but I digress. Okay, so that's great and all, but why use VEX when we could just do it with backticks? Well, both methods are totally valid, but there are some key differences in the way Houdini processes VEX that will make certain tasks a lot easier with fewer hoops to jump through. First, definitions. Backticks exist in a system known as channel expressions, and channel expressions use a language called HScript. This is different from VEX, which is its own language also. HScript can be easily spotted by global variables that use the dollar sign syntax. For instance, these two variables you've probably seen at some point, $f for the current frame, or $t for the current time in seconds. Conversely, VEX uses the at syntax which is why it plays really nicely with attributes, which also use the at syntax. Aside from syntax, another difference is that you can't use vex functions directly in a channel as an expression. You need hscript for that. There are also subtle differences between functions as well that you need to look out for. 
For example, when you use the point expression in HScript, it's a little different from using the same function in Vex. So make sure when you're Googling these functions to specify whether you're looking for the HScript channel function or the Vex version. Yes, it's annoying and it's weird, but it's just a quirk of Houdini that we all need to live with. Another difference is that Vex is, hands down, much faster. Not only is it quicker just to jot down a couple lines of code rather than to have to drop down a bunch of nodes for more complex operations, but it actually computes in parallel. What this means is that instead of running through one point or prim at a time, Vex will operate on as many points or prims as it can simultaneously, and this is limited only by your computer's hardware. Third, a wrangle has the option to run over every single point or every single prim or just once on the detail level whereas HScript can only run once on the detail level. This enables Vex to talk directly to the geo in a super helpful way. Like in the code above, we were able to just grab the current prim number as a seed, as opposed to having to set up a for loop, make a meta node, grab that attribute, yada yada. You can think of a wrangle as a loop by default, all set up and ready to go. One more benefit to a wrangle node or a vop node, which is still using Vex under the hood, is that it has multiple input ports, which allow you to reference other nodes just by wiring them in. Again, this is much easier than what we had before where we needed to create a hacky spare input and talk to our nodes that way. Okay, enough rambling. Here's a practical example. What if we want to check if our geo has a material already and only assign a new one if it doesn't? Using channels and backticks, this would require multiple nodes. It wouldn't be very readable, but in Vex, we can do it in just a few lines of code. First, let's assign a material to one of our shapes just for testing purposes. Let's drop down a material node, and in the group field here, we'll do some of the magic we talked about in our last video about group syntax. So I'll just type at name equals zero here, and then I'll grab our mat zero, and we can see that now all our boxes are red. In our attribute delete, let's make sure we're not clearing out the material attribute here. So let's add a caret shop material path in the prim attributes to remove that from the selection. Now, in our wrangle, we just need to wrap this code in an if statement to check for an existing material. So we'll say if shop material path equals blank, and then an OP curly brace here, and a close one at the end, and there you have it. Super, super simple code, and you just saved yourself multiple nodes. Now, obviously, I've been skipping over a lot of the actual code bits here. The stuff like if statements and data types is common between all programming languages. So I recommend doing a basic Python tutorial or something to get up to speed if you're not familiar. It's really easy, and honestly, it's really fun once you get the hang of it. Okay, that's all for now, folks. Going to keep this one as brief as possible. But I hope this was helpful and helps you to understand the kind of flexibility you can get with just a teensy tiny bit of code. In the next video, we're going to utilize everything we've learned so far to bravely go where, well, unfortunately, you're just going to need to go here at some point. The, the internet. internet. We're going to mess around with importing and processing external models and even see how we can manipulate an existing particle simulation using only the exported geometry. See you there.